Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the course of his discussion of the second main part of justice, that is benevolence or beneficence, in his work on duties, Cicero is going to talk about degrees of relationship, degrees of closeness to us, and, and what is really required of us in terms of doing good to other people, going beyond the strict requirements of justice itself, and showing benevolence or generosity or moral goodness to them maybe even showing charity. He tells us that um, the interests of society and its, its common bonds will be best conserved if kindness is shown to each individual in proportion to the closeness of his relationship. So he says, well, who are we actually connected with? And notice that the Stoics, which is what he's summarizing here, they think that we do have some sort of relationship with the entire human race, the entire species, regardless of where people are from, regardless of what language they speak, what religion they may practice, what color their skin may be. All of these, you know, you might say, fall under the same basic rubric of humanity. And this is what we call Stoic cosmopolitanism or at least one aspect of it, the notion that we are all related to each other in some way that has some moral obligations laid upon us because of that. So he tells us, we must trace back to their ultimate sources, uh, uh, the principles of fellowship, that is communitas, and society, so kietas, that nature has established among human beings. And he says, the first principle is that which is found in the connection that subsists, the vinculum, the, the chain, the bond that exists between all the members of the human race. What is that then? What do we all have in common? You might say our DNA. Cicero says, it's the possession of reason and the, the possession of speech, which in Greek, by the way, are the same thing, logos. In Latin, he talks about, um, here we go, uh, the bond of connection is reason, ratio, and speech, oratio. He's playing on, on the rhyme there between the two of them. And he says that by these, we are able to do teaching and learning, communicating, discussing, reasoning. These associate human beings together. Even if we don't speak the same language, we're able to share in a common humanity. And so he goes on and he says that um, in no other particular are we further removed from the nature of beasts. This is what makes us capable of justice to those with whom we don't share a common basis because we do have an even more common basis or bond in our common humanity. So he says, this is the most comprehensive bond that unites human beings together and all to all. And under it, he says, there is a common right to all things that nature has produced for the common use of human beings. So although there can be private property and there can be laws, there are certain basic things, certain basic goods, you might say, of the universe that we shouldn't deprive each other of. We might think of some of these as access to fire in ancient times, or possession of clean water, uh, an air uh, that we can successfully breathe in without getting cancer. These environmental things 
are important. And, and Cicero goes further. He says that when we have human beings in a common situation of want or danger, they will come together, or they ought to come together. Instead of preying upon each other because of their differences, they ought to come together and be good to one another, take care of each other, show benevolence or beneficence towards each other. He says... Um, in this, you know, that, that the, the poets teach us uh, to bestow even on a stranger what it costs nothing to give, like, like access to water. He says we should adopt these principles and always be contributing something to the common weal. But of course, you know, this, this, there's, there's a degree uh, uh, to which we can do this. We can't do this with everybody equally. We have to sort of parse it out. More close is the group of people that we feel ourselves to have something in common with. Maybe to the extent that we actually close out the rest of the world in doing so. The more ethnocentric we are, the more we're inclined to do this. So we could talk about one's country or one's own culture or society. And he says, um, there are many degrees of closeness or remoteness in human society to proceed beyond the universal bond of our common humanity. There is the closer one of belonging to the same people or the same tribe, you know, gen, the, the gens, the nazio, the belonging to the same linguistic group he also talks about. And uh, he says, by this people are more closely bound together. They, they feel themselves to have a greater connection. They see the other as more similar to them. And they can relate to them easier. Then we have, in his view, one city. One's local community, we might say. This could be a village. This could be a metropolitan area. Like, for instance, I'm here in Milwaukee. I identify as a person from Wisconsin, in addition to identifying as an American, and in addition to identifying as a person in the world. I identify as somebody from Wisconsin and from my city of Milwaukee, the greater Milwaukee area. In our own time, we might also think about virtual communities as being part of this as well. These are communities that we engage in where most of the people that we're involved with are at best fellow citizens or neighbors, fellow residents. They're not necessarily our friends and they're not actually related to us, except in a very distant way, if at all. Then he says, um, oh, before we go on, he says, uh, the, the people living in the same community have many things in common. He says, they have a common forum, that is, a legal place to gather, uh, common temples, ways of worshiping the divine, common colonnades. Interesting, now we're getting to things where the city or private citizens have established them, and we feel that they're ours, right? They, we feel like they belong to us, like a, a sports stadium might be this way, or a common uh, television or radio station, I, any of these sorts of things. Streets, statutes, laws, courts, rights of suffrage. To say nothing of social and friendly circles and diverse business relations with many. This is a much closer set of relations than at the level of the country. Then he says, going a little bit even further in, a still closer social union exists between kindred. Starting with the infinite bond of union of the human race in general, now we're getting to a, a very narrow circle, he says. And he's visualizing this as circles. So he says, um, the reproductive instinct is by nature's gift the common possession of all living creatures. So one of the very close connections is that between man and woman in the family or in a marriage, reproduction, right? So he says husband and wife, the next between parents and children. Then we find one home with everything in common. And this may include many generations. And he says, this is the foundation of, of civil government. Then follow the bonds between brothers and sisters, between siblings. Then those of first and second cousins. And then when they can't be sheltered under the same roof, we have clan structures, you might say, or, or you know, larger assemblages of people who say, oh, you're my cousins, you're related to me, we're part of this group. That's a much closer circle. 
Now, here's the, the fundamental question that comes up. Now that we've distinguished all of these interesting concentric circles of closeness you know, or proximity and then distance, going all the way out to the entire human race, who do we owe the greatest affection or who should we be benevolent to? Some people might say, well, you should think about the entire human race. You shouldn't play favorites. Uh, wherever your, your money or your time can do the most good, this is the notion of effective altruism, that's where you should be putting it. Cicero doesn't think that's the case. Cicero says that, and this is his view on this, and he's not a, a necessarily along with the Stoics and all of this, country should come first, he says. Um, here, here we go. He says that... Uh, when with a rational spirit you surveyed the whole field, there's no social relation among them more close, none more dear, than that which links each of us with our country. Parents are dear, children are dear, relatives, friends, but one native land embraces all of our loves. And who that is true would hesitate to give his life for her if by his death he could render her a service. He also says those who do damage to their country, to their, their community. This might be, you know, betraying the country. This might actually be destroying the economy. This might be environmental damage. He says they're traitors. They are execrable, you know. They're, they're terrible people. They're monsters. Here he's actually talking about Caesar and other people of his ilk. So he says, if a contrast and comparison were to be made to find out where most our moral obligations do, country would come first. Then would come family. And within the family, parents first, then children, then the whole family who looked, he says, to us for support and can have no other protection. Then our kinsmen, like second cousins, uh, people like that. And then, you know, the rest of the world, or then one city. So there is a clear priority. A very interesting difference, though. He talks about friends. Friends are different than family, although there's nothing to keep you from being friends with your brother or your father or your child or, or anything like that. But he does say that, that friends, he says, the bonds of friendship... There is none more noble, none more powerful than when good men of congenial character are joined in intimate friend, friendship. For if we discover in another that moral goodness, uh, it attracts us and makes us friends to the, to the one in whose character it seems to dwell. And virtue attracts us. Um, justice and generosity in particular, he says. Now, what do we owe our friends? We don't owe them the same thing as we owe our country. We don't owe them the same thing as we owe our family. Friendship and familial relations are not exactly the same thing. It's a different kind of affection for the ancients. So he tells us that um, intimate relationship of life and living, counsel, conversation, and here's a really interesting thing, encouragement, comfort, and sometimes even reproof, sometimes even criticism, sometimes saying, what the hell's wrong with you, buddy? That belongs to friendship. That is what we owe to them. We don't necessarily owe that to our countrymen. We should have something like that within certain parts of our family, but Cicero thought that we also need friends for this as well. He talks about the, the, the need for congeniality or connection of character, having people who are, who are like us. And that may not be the case with, with a country. But... With each of these, there's a certain type of beneficence or benevolence that's due, a certain modality. We owe something to members of the human race as members of the human race. We owe something to those who are in our close circle of family and friends. We owe things to those with whom we share a community. But we have to look at these things, according to Cicero, rationally. We don't want to just try to give everybody the same thing, that would not actually be beneficence, and that would not lead to justice. So this is how Cicero conceives of it, with these concentric circles and these duties that are owed to people who are closer to us. 